And tennis can feel like a rather opaque topic as you begin to dive into the world of professional wireless, and for good reason. Capturing invisible yet highly specific radio frequencies, traveling at a rate of 300 million meters per second, can feel a lot like capturing lightning in a bottle. The good news is that antennas operate according to similar principles that many of us already understand from dealing with microphones. Things such as polar patterns, gain, side and rear rejection, and directivity. All of these concepts are as applicable to antennas as they are to microphones. And like microphones, antennas are just additional tools in our toolbox, with different designs being more or less suited for certain environments, shooting contexts, and workflows. In both cases, having any tool on hand is a lot better than having none. Based on this analogy, I'll start the video off by looking at some of the most commonly used tools in the production sound trade, moving on to more obscure or specialized solutions, and then explaining why each might be more or less useful in a given context. After exploring the different antenna systems, I'll then explain the difference between active and passive antennas, how to integrate filters into your system, splitting an antenna to multiple receivers, and best practices of deployment. I'll also briefly touch on some new technologies such as Dante and RF over fiber. Finally, I should mention that this video is based on my own research and experience. I'm not a full-time RF engineer, nor did I write my thesis on antenna systems. I'm just a freelance production sound mixer working in a big city in Canada. And knowing this stuff is an increasingly important part of the job. If I miss anything, oversimplify, or get anything wrong, I encourage you to please contribute to the conversation using the comment section below. That way we can all grow our knowledge and improve our craft. Let's get started. Any sound mixer who operates out of a bag will be accustomed to the good old whip antenna. You know those flexible little metal rods that stick out of receivers and transmitters? Oftentimes these guys are all it takes to get the job done. A whip antenna is a single quarter wavelength antenna that requires a ground plane in order to operate. And an example of a ground plane would be the chassis of a receiver or the uh, body of a transmitter. Whips perform their best when trimmed to the proper length relative to the frequency that they're receiving. This is a diagram from AudioRoot explaining what length to trim an antenna in order to optimize it for reception of a particular frequency. Whip antennas have an omnidirectional pickup pattern, meaning that they can receive transmissions from the entire 360 degrees surrounding them. Because a whip antenna requires a ground plane in order to operate effectively, you can't just strap it to a stand attached to a long cable. However, you can always use a magnetic mount to remote a whip antenna to the roof of a car. In this case, the car's body acts as a large ground plane, which goes a long way to improving the reception of a standard whip. Why would you want to use a whip antenna? Whips provide a simple and compact antenna solution for receivers and transmitters. They're ideal for straightforward bag setups where their small size and omnidirectional pickup pattern helps keep things simple. You'll often see whips being used by sound mixers in run and gun setups for ENG or unscripted scenarios where locations are really dynamic. Besides whips, dipoles are probably the most commonly used antennas due to their easy deployment and flexibility. Dipole antennas are essentially two whip antennas mounted together facing opposite directions. Two popular dipole antennas come to mind when discussing this particular design. The Electrosonics SNA600 and the Betso Bowtie. While both of these antennas utilize the same design principle, they differ somewhat in their approach. The Electrosonics SNA600 is tunable to offer optimal frequency reception within a given block with a 100 MHz bandwidth. For example, if your transmitters are tuned to a frequency of around 590 MHz, you would just tune your dipole antenna to receive that. Frequencies outside of its 100 MHz bandwidth are attenuated by about 15 decibels. The Betso Bowtie is a dipole antenna with a fixed wideband reception of 470 MHz to 700 MHz. It also has a built-in low-pass filter at 700 MHz. This design basically works out of the box as long as your transmitters operate within 470 and 700, which most of us do. Although dipole antennas have a lobal pickup pattern in the vertical axis, the horizontal axis is omnidirectional, and as such, we generally refer to them as omni antennas. Recently, more manufacturers have jumped on the small dipole train, and now you can pick up a sound device's Monarch antenna with a broadband tuning range of up to 1525 MHz. So why would I use a dipole antenna? First of all, I'm gonna give you a bit of a technical breakdown comparing dipole antennas to whip antennas. Dipoles are not necessarily better antennas than whip antennas. And in fact, a properly tuned quarter wavelength whip antenna with a proper ground plane will perform exactly the same as a dipole antenna. However, in reality, that's never the case because receivers are too small to be an optimal ground plane for any whip antenna the performance of a whip antenna will be inherently compromised. Since the two arms of a dipole antenna balance each other perfectly, there's no need for a ground plane. Thus, 
If you have the space to deploy a dipole antenna, it will always perform better than a whip antenna. In practical terms, I will say that small dipole antennas tend to offer the best bang for your buck flexibility for folks working in a ton of different real world scenarios. The primary reason I say this is that for one person band sound mixers, you can walk around the city all day with two dipole antennas clipped to your bag. The next day you might find yourself in a crowded film set and you can grab one of those dipole antennas and remote it 10 feet in the air in order to achieve line of sight with your transmitters. For this reason, dipole antennas are dollar for dollar, the cheapest way to squeeze a lot more flexibility and signal stability from your wireless system. Omni antennas are, unsurprisingly, omnidirectional. This means that they can receive signals from 360 degrees around wherever they're placed. I like to think of Omni antennas as big old whips that you can just throw on a mast and deploy remotely. They basically operate under the same principles as dipoles, and for the most part, they seem to be designed to be deployed remotely on stands rather than clipped to a bag. Why would I use an Omni antenna? These antennas excel in one specific situation. You're stuck in the middle of set and there will be scenes shot all around you. For example, let's say you're set up in the middle of a house and you're on the main floor and your boom op is upstairs with the talent and all of those wireless transmissions are going to be moving around the house um, into different rooms. In this context, a spaced pair of Omni antennas will perform really well because they can receive transmissions from 360 degrees around where they're located. This is the rather ubiquitous sound card antenna that looks kind of like a shark's fin. LPDA is an acronym that stands for Log Periodic Dipole Array. That's right, the shark fin antenna is essentially just a bunch of half-wave dipoles tuned to different frequencies and strapped to a boom. This is a nice skeletal example of an LPDA that shows you the half-wave dipoles strapped along this metal rod, or boom. However, these days shark fin antennas are often designed using printed circuit boards, with the antenna elements being left as traces on the board. This PCB circuit board antenna uses the exact same design principles as branded antennas and has been tested by sound mixers around the world. They can even be painted black. I'll provide a link to the PCB antennas below if you feel like adding a pair to your collection. More rugged and elegant examples of shark fins abound, such as these passive LPDAs by Wizzycom. Anyways, LPDAs are like the shotgun mic of the antenna world. Serious side and rear rejection with a very high directionality. You get the best performance with these pointed directly at your transmitters, with an appreciable loss of gain beyond 90 degrees on either side. Why would I use a shark fin antenna? Shark fin antennas are useful when you need to extend the signal reliability of your wireless system with a relatively narrow beam width. They're ideal for stages and straightforward narrative setups, and are particularly awesome when used outdoors. I've actually seen BTS footage of sound mixers who have remoted shark fin antennas on stands and had their assistants move them around and point them towards the action, such as in this still from the Ursa Straps video interviewing Stéphane Boucher. A relatively new innovation in the antenna world, the polarization diversity antenna combines two antennas into one, the an LPDA and a dipole antenna. Here's what the RF venue diversity fin looks like. As you can see, the dipole antenna is mounted directly onto the LPDA in a horizontal orientation. This antenna utilizes the horizontal polarization of the dipole antenna and the vertical polarization of the LPDA to more effectively handle multipath. Multipath is the name given to RF that is reflected off of beams, walls, etc. The theory behind using a cross-polarized design is that when RF bounces around, it's more likely to hit one of these antennas than it is to hit two vertically polarized shark fin antennas. In reality, I'm not sure how big of a problem multipath really is for location sound mixers, but I will say that the compact design makes it a lot easier to deploy one of these bad boys in compact locations. Why would I use a diversity fin antenna? This antenna is a great solution due to its small size and easy deployability. When space is at a premium, which is almost always on a film set, it's nice to have only one fin to deploy instead of two. It's also a cool solution for really dynamic shoots. Um, like for example, last year I worked on a film as a boom op and we had to do a lot of walk and talks in the downtown core where there's a lot of stray RF bouncing around. And Sound Mixer used a diversity fin antenna mounted to his bag and followed behind the camera team and we had zero dropouts. And in this case, two LPDAs would have been very unwieldy. The Spotlight Antenna by RF Venue is a near field antenna that is a circular rubberized mat and it's low profile and it's designed to live in close proximity to your talent. You can hide it under a carpet or beneath a wooden stage. The concept behind this antenna is that you're utilizing a low gain and creating a bubble of reception in close proximity to the antenna itself. By localizing reception to a small bubble, the overall noise floor is reduced considerably, allowing for better reception in crowded RF environments. Why would I use a near field antenna? 
In congested RF environments, the overall RF noise floor can be extremely high. Thus, using a high gain antenna like an LPDA can actually work against you by raising the noise floor that's coming into your receivers. Imagine being in New York City on the top of a skyscraper to shoot some interviews. All around you are cell phone towers. You point your shark fin antennas at the host and they're picking up your transmitter, but they're also picking up a ton of carrier noise because they're beaming through the host and they're picking up all the RF from the buildings behind. In this context, if you have a spotlight antenna, you can just toss it at the feet of your talent, plug that into one side of your diversity receiver, and on the other side, you just have a whip and you're good to go. You're creating a little local uh, network for your receiver. And to me, this is like as close as you can get to hardwiring your transmitters to your receiver. The circularly polarized or helical antenna is brought out by power users who need serious gain and serious directionality. These antennas got their name because the element of the antenna is essentially a circular helix. The helical antenna takes a few forms. There are remote passive helical antennas like the RF venue CP beam as well as active antennas from Betso. However, the helix design can also be omnidirectional, such as the monopole helix found in the Comtech 216 transmitter. Affectionately known as the rubber ducky antenna, it contains a coil length of wire in its sheath. Why would I use a circularly polarized antenna? Because these antennas are great at capturing RF from any angle, CP antennas are great for car-to-car -car work. They're your friend if you need super long range, like football fields. They're also favored by many as an IFB transmitter due to their extremely high gain. The Yagi Uda style will be familiar to pretty much everybody on planet Earth because they're on rooftops all over the world. In some ways, the Yagi is similar to an LPDA in that it is a series of dipoles on a boom. However, the Yagi differs from an LPDA in that only one of these dipoles is an active antenna element, and the other ones serve as reflectors or directors of the signal. This approach lends to a very high directionality and high gain. Because of their limited bandwidth, these antennas aren't a very common sight among production sound mixers. However, for those working in the license band of 940 megahertz, there is a Yagi antenna available from PSC that's pretty cool. Why would I use a Yagi antenna? I would only use a Yagi antenna if I was operating on a fixed frequency. That is, if I knew I was going to be on the same frequency all the time, then I would use an antenna that's tuned to that specific frequency. However, since production sound mixers often need a wide frequency band to choose from, Yagi antenna wouldn't be my first choice. The type of cable that you use to deploy your remote antennas is important. RF signals require 50 ohm coaxial cable. And if you grab a 75 ohm coaxial cable and try to use that, you're gonna have a bad time. Generally speaking, really thick coax cable is used for long cable runs. More on that later. For now, I will say that RG8X is what many folks are using for its relatively low loss and flexibility. Belden 9046 is pretty cool too. The difference between active and passive antennas is pretty straightforward. Active antennas have an amplifier at the antenna element to boost the RF signal. So far, all of the antennas I've discussed have been passive designs. However, there are active models of LPDAs, Omnis, and circularly polarized antennas available. So why would you want to use an active antenna? Pay attention, because this is important. The only reason that you would ever want to use an active antenna is so that you can achieve unity gain at your receivers. When you deploy your remote antennas, all coax cable will introduce signal attenuation to the RF that reaches your receivers. When using lengths of 10, 20 to 50 feet of coax cable, the amount of loss is minimal enough that you can usually get away with passive antennas. However, if you're running 100 feet of RG8X, you're introducing around negative eight to negative 10 decibels of loss to your signal. This is where an active antenna comes in handy because you can bump the gain of the antenna by eight or 10 decibels overcoming the loss of the cable and achieving unity gain at your receiver. I like to visualize this as increasing the water pressure on a hose. Just be careful because too much water pressure, i.e. gain, will easily overload your receivers. It's a delicate dance. The tricky thing with active antennas is that when you boost the gain on an antenna, you're not just boosting the gain on the signals you want to receive. You're also boosting the gain on the entire RF noise floor. And this is where filters can come in really handy. Filters are pretty straightforward. They filter out unwanted RF signals from reaching your receivers. Sometimes the front-end filtering built into your receivers isn't strong enough, and you have to fortify your defenses. Some antennas have built-in passive filtering, such as the Betso Bowtie, which has a built-in low-pass filter at 700 megahertz. Whips also naturally attenuate frequencies outside of that which they are tuned to. However, a lot of LPDAs have a pretty wide bandwidth and let in a lot of signals. It can help to avoid problems by pairing them with a passive bandpass filter that only lets in the frequencies that you want. Here's an example of a passive bandpass filter by RF. Venue. 
This model attenuates everything outside of the 560 to 608 MHz band by 50 decibels. Many different exclusions are available. WYSIWYGON makes an active shark fin antenna called the LFA that has built-in tunable filters, which are a great way of mitigating nasty RF from reaching your receivers. Okay, if you've made it this far, you now have a pretty good grasp of how different antennas work. But now you might be wondering, how do I integrate two antennas with multiple receivers? Basically, it all depends on how many receivers you're running. Let's say, for example, you're using two Electrosonics SR receivers and an RF venue diversity fin. You need to split the two signals coming out of the diversity fin into two additional signals for your receivers. A passive two by one splitter by mini circuits or RF venue is the cheapest solution. Electrosonics even resells the mini circuit stuff because it's so good. You're going to need one splitter for each antenna. Antenna A splits into receiver board A on each receiver. Antenna B splits into receiver board B on each receiver. And voila, you're set up. This solution will work with any passive antennas. Just be careful that the coax you're using isn't introducing too much loss, as the splitters also introduce a little bit of loss themselves. Now let's say you have four SR receivers and you want to set them up with two antennas. Sure, you could use four passive splitters, but this would introduce quite a bit of signal loss. Like coax cable, every BNC or SMA termination introduces some loss to a signal. Thankfully, products like PSC's multi-SMA exist for this exact situation. This is an active RF distro, which means it must be powered by your bag's BDS system. It uses the power from your BDS to recover the losses inherent to splitting the RF signal across several receiver boards and it can even provide power to active antennas. Finally, there are tons of elegant super slot integrated solutions. The PSC 6-pack provides slot in RF management for up to three receivers. The sound devices SL6 and SL2 are further options for RF distribution. Discussing these designs in depth would be a video unto itself, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention them here. There's more than one way to skin a cat, and in this video, I've only touched on the most straightforward and conventional approaches to handling remote antenna deployment. Nowadays, a lot of folks are using Dante technology to remote their entire receiver boards close to set. This eliminates the need for using long coax cables when you can instead just use a single ethernet cable. And it also allows you to control your receivers from your sound card. Additionally, we now have the technology to send RF over fiber using optical converters. This allows for cable runs of several kilometers using a single fiber optic cable with no loss. I'll be exploring these concepts in more depth in future videos. Before we wrap up, I just want to touch briefly on some best practices. All the antenna systems I've discussed operate their best when they have line of sight with transmitters. This is truly the most important factor in enhancing RF stability in any wireless system. Getting your antennas 8 to 10 feet in the air, well above the bodies of crew members, will yield you 90% of your results, with diminishing returns if you keep raising them higher and higher. Remember, try to keep things simple. Passive antennas and short runs of coax cable are where it's at for signal integrity. If you can, use the best antenna for the job. If you can't, use what you have and stick to the fundamentals. I really hope that this has been a useful and educational video. If so, do me a favor and hit that like button. Subscribe to my channel if you like videos like this. It really goes a long way in supporting what I do. And leave me a comment if you have any questions or want to contribute to the conversation. Peace.